Right, after lots of planning, lots of talk, finally we get uh, get George Gammon and Jeff Booth together. I uh, would love to have done this in person, but I think we're in uh, I think we're in three different continents or something. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> yeah, probably, yeah. <laughs> we, we will use the power of the internet. Um, and I I actually have a feeling you two probably agree on a lot more than you maybe realize or or people think. Um, but I think people want to hear this conversation. So I've got a structure. I'm going to keep to my structure. Um, uh, George, you've been on the show before. People know you. Um, uh, Jeff's been on the show a bunch of times and has a book and does a lot of the conferences, but so probably know him a bit more. But uh, So I start with you, George. Just introduce yourself to people if they don't know you already. Just give them your background and tell them why you're here. George Gammon. Most people probably know me from my YouTube channels. The one is uh, creatively named George Gammon. And where I just do <laughs> whiteboard videos <laughs> on uh, macro topics, and then the other one is the Rebel Capitalist channel, and then we've got a podcast called the Rebel Capitalist Show. Excellent. And look, Jeff, a lot of people who listen to my show know who you are, but hopefully we're going to get some of George's uh, listeners in who might not know you. So uh, give them your intro. Uh, Jeff Booth. I wrote a book called The Price of Tomorrow: Why Deflation Is Key to an Abundant Future. Uh, long-time uh, entrepreneur, technologist, uh, now Bitcoin advocate. Uh, I started a fund called Ego Death uh, that is investing in layer two and everything that's coming to Bitcoin. Excellent. Right. So uh, this came from a, a, a Twitter conversation a while back between the two of you, a short one, and then somebody said, you two should get on a podcast. And I think I just interjected myself and said, I'll host, <laughs> I'm here. Uh, and it took a while to get it together, but, but here we are. Um, I do think, George, I'm going to start with you. I think uh, I think a lot of Bitcoiners have you wrong. I think they think you're anti-Bitcoin, and I don't believe you are. No, no, no. I just personally, yeah, I just think you see it differently from other people. So it's, it's quite quite a broad question, but could you just start by outlining as best you can what you think of Bitcoin, what your kind of uh, position is with Bitcoin, and... Uh, um, where you think maybe there's like this common narrative in Bitcoin or, com or common ideas where you think people have it wrong? Well, I think that it's not just in the Bitcoin space, it's in the gold space. And I think just it's on Twitter, it's human nature, where people tend to articulate their argument in the form of certainties instead of probabilities. And they talk about solutions instead of trade-offs. So that's kind of where it starts with me. Uh, but as far as my position on Bitcoin, I think everyone should own it. Uh, but I, I don't think that everyone should own it because it's going to a million dollars. It, it might, uh, or just get you rich or something like that. It might, but again, we're talking about probabilities. I think everyone should own it to have purchasing power outside of the system, uh, especially moving forward with central bank digital currencies. I think uh, there's an extremely high probability that we'll get that within the next, eh, call it five years, something like that. So in that type of world, I definitely want to own physical gold. Uh, I definitely want to own some Bitcoin. And I think, unfortunately, we're going to have to play ball. Uh, those people who are, I say us, talking about people who value freedom and liberty and free market capitalism and privacy. Uh, I, for most of the people, I don't think they're going to have a choice because you still have to have a nine to five job. Uh, you still have an employer. You have to have a paycheck. I mean, Nigel Farage is a great example of that, you know. I mean, he's still, let's just assume that he's getting paid from YouTube, from his YouTube channel with AdSense or something. He still has to have a bank account for that. It's just, it is what it is. So if they debank him, then that gives uh, those people a lot of power. Where if he just had another bank account or something outside of the system, and then he might be able to navigate that type of situation. Or, but just for the average Joe, you know, they're probably never going to find themselves in the position of Nigel Farage, but just gives them an opportunity to have purchasing power outside of the ecosystem of a social score, let's say. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, Bitcoin is going to give them the opportunity or even physical gold to transact completely outside of that system because I don't think with, let's say we get a CBDC in three years. Uh, you know, no matter how fast Bitcoin progresses, I don't know that it'll progress to the point where you can pay all of your expenses unless you want to live like in an Amish community. And if you want to do that, that's great. Uh, 
Uh, but for most people, you know, paying their rent, putting their kid through college, uh, medical insurance, et cetera, you're going to have to have dollars if you're in the United States to do that. You're not going to be able to transact exclusively in that Bitcoin ecosystem. But I think to have some purchasing power or as much as you can outside to where you can transact, where you can and have that outside of the realm of, of that social score, I think that's definitely going to be beneficial. And then I also, uh, you know, people say, well, what should I do? What should I do? Uh, I know this doesn't apply to a lot of people, but if you have the resources to potentially live in another country where they use cash for a large percentage of their settlement, I I'd suggest considering that as a plan B. Because although, like, as an example, I'm in Colombia right now, will they have a central bank digital currency here? Probably, most likely. But it at least buys you some time for the Bitcoin uh, ecosystem to be built up to a point where it might be more realistic for you know maybe 80% of your transactions to be within that bit, that uh, ecosystem. I just don't think that happens overnight. I think we get a central bank digital currency before then. So that would be my argument for owning Bitcoin. Uh, now, as far as Bitcoin becoming uh, the global currency uh, or a Bitcoin standard, if you will, however you want to articulate that message, I think those probabilities are, are, are much, much different. And, um, but th then we get into the theoretical, which I think is very interesting. And I, that's a discussion that I think uh, Jeff enjoys, you know, these thought experiments. Uh, but I, I don't know that Jeff and I would, would differ on too many things other than just the probabilities. Okay, that's great. And Jeff, uh, I don't want you to challenge anything uh, uh, George has said just yet. Uh, I'd rather you, again, just outline your position yeah, your views on Bitcoin, uh, where you see its role in the world. By the way, I keep looking down here because I'm keeping notes. Yeah. <laughs> so just to make sure I, I, I'm aware of uh, uh, the things you're talking about so I can refer back to them. Yeah, and uh, and specifically, I would say just quickly on, on George, there's probably not there. You opened it perfectly. There's probably not a lot we disagree with. We may disagree with probabilities. Um, and, and I'm just looking through probabilities uh, of essentially – what happens when you change the structure of something that is uncompromising and how would that change the reality? So we measure the world out of the existing world. And so it's easy to carry those biases into something new. Every, in fact, every, every time a company gets disrupted, it, it gets just disrupted from the exact same reason. And I would argue that disruption is just happening at a level that we can't see because it affects every single other thing. So simply, uh, I'd say that my, the easiest way to explain this uh, for me is, is, is everyone knows technology falls to, or sorry, pr uh, prices fall to the marginal cost of production over time. You can stop that from ha happening for a while with regulation, but the process still goes on and it goes on because competition moves to other regions in the world and then competes with your region that you artificially created um, a, a regulatory environment to to protect, and then your your regulated industry gets wiped out. So over time, prices fall to the marginal cost of production. What is the marginal cost of production of a line of code? Or what is the marginal cost of production of a line of code created by more lines of code? And what you can see is what's happening in the world is we're having exponentially increasing uh, productivity. That exponentially increasing productivity will soon move into robotics, and it won't just be the digital realm; it'll be the physical realm as well. So it'll that prices fall to the marginal cost of production will include physical things. So if one and two are true, which they are true, then and then and you had something sent. So measuring that happening. To see that happening, you'd have to have a fixed number of units of currency. What that would mean is all prices would fall forever um, against the fixed uh, prices of currency. So we don't, we live in a system that's opposite of that today. We have a system that increases number of units of currency to make prices rise. But measuring from a fixed uh, number of units of currency, what it means is prices would fall forever. Um, now the question in probabilities, it, the only question in probabilities is, can it stay decentralized and secure? Um, and, but if it can, 
if it stays decentralized and secure, that's in, it's inevitable that Bitcoin is repricing the entire existing system rather than the other way around. And when George just said priced in a million dollars Bitcoin, I don't think that way. Um, I don't think, I think anytime you're pricing Bitcoin in a fiat currency that is manipulating the number of units of currency for to gain power. Right, but that's why I also said to get rich. Exactly, and I, that and that we agree, and that that's where we agree on, and that's why these these things matter. The, the semantics matter, and people kind of yell on Twitter about the semantics, but I don't think it. All, I think all it's doing is uncompromisingly, whether it's through deflation or inflation, repricing the world. And if it stays decentralized and, and secure, then it's inevitable that that happens. Now, the time frame, you could argue the time frame, but it is. If it stays decentralized and secure, no one, nobody can change that that fact. What it means is, is you could have blow ups, you could have you could have currencies revalued, you could have uh, a whole bunch of things happen along the way. But it is essentially Bitcoin repricing everything else, rather than the other way around. I find myself in this uh, weird position where I end up agreeing with both of you. Um, so I, I agree with uh, Jeff long term, but actually, George, you're one of my preferred people to see talk about Bitcoin because most Bitcoiners tend to parrot the same thing or argue about things I'm not interested in. And so when I see you comment, if I disagree, I will uh, I might post a cheeky reply, but other times I find myself completely agreeing with you. I think you're looking at uh, Bitcoin through some pretty practical yeah, eyes. You know, look, if, um, if we lived in a computer simulation, which maybe we do, I mean, sometimes I do the news all the time on the Rebel Capitalist channel and almost every single day, I'm like, we got to be living in the matrix. I mean, this is, like, did you guys see? Tell I'm going to forget my point, but did you guys see the other day that Republic First Bank almost went bust? Not not First Republic. Nope. Now it's Republic First. Yeah. And I did this story, and I'm like, you you, you got to be kidding me now. That this is definitely a simulation. The, the, things are just getting too weird. But anyway, if we lived in this computer simulation, yeah, absolutely. What Jeff is talking about is true because you've got uh, the the deflationary. Uh, characteristics of human productivity, and then you have a fixed currency supply. My argument is we don't. We we live in a world where human beings actually control the money. And if we look back throughout history, you see what human beings always do. It, it, it's like clockwork. So I think that in oh, if let's just assume we fast forward 20 years or 15 years and Bitcoin is being used as like a global currency, I think it'll be uh, fractional reserve. You'll have fractional reserve banking. And uh, I know, I think Jeff's argument there is that you have instant settlement, but I, and I get why that would potentially reduce the need for fractional reserve uh, lending. But I don't know that it would completely eliminate it uh, just because as human beings, we're always going to want cheaper credit and we're always going to want access to you know unlimited credit. We're always going to want a higher interest rate to be paid on our savings. Now, maybe you won't have banks because you've got, uh, you know, the key characteristics of Bitcoin that differentiate it is you got 21 million, you got a fixed supply, uh, assuming that it's not fractionally lent, and then you can put it in your back pocket and instant settlement. But I don't think that those three characteristics in them uh, in and of themselves eliminate 5,000 years of human history. And, uh, you know, it's funny as last night, I've, I just had this cold, as you guys can probably tell. So I've, I don't usually watch TV, but I watched a couple episodes of that Netflix series on Rome. And I saw what uh, the, the, the crazy kid uh, Caligula was doing. And he brought back these treason uh, trials or something like that. And I don't know if this is exactly what he said, but in the, in the series, he goes, well, if you haven't done anything wrong, then you shouldn't be worried that now I have power to destroy your life. And I'm like, wow, it's basically echoing exactly what we hear today. And it's just history just repeats itself over and over and over again. So I go back to the gold standard as an example. You know, the, the most strict gold standard that we have, an example, that's the late 1800s. And so, Peter, let me ask you a question. Between 1880 and 1900, do you think the money supply increased more or less than it did from 2003 to 2023 under a strict or a, a fiat standard, if you will? I mean, I'd just be guessing. It's the same. Oh, it's the same. Yeah, so M2 money supply, if you look at it, increased the exact same 
on a complete fiat standard from 2003 to 2023, as it did under a strict gold standard from 1880 to 1900. So that strict gold standard really didn't limit the amount of currency units, uh, I would argue, at all. And so, George, yeah. this, but but this is this is why this is so critical, and this is why if if this is the first time in human history that you could have decentralization and security together, and you could never have that before because essentially, and I've said this many times in many of my writing and 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 such that I would agree with you on the point that if a money could be corrupted by human beings, it would be, not it might be, it would be, because it gives so much power to the human beings that corrupt it. So that is, human history is filled with that. And you see it everywhere. And so when you reference this, when gold gets centralized, because of the, the speed and velocity of markets, you have to build something on top of it, and it gets centralized further and further, um, and you, you build fractional reserve on top of it. So I get all of the things you're saying throughout history. The question, and this is the this is the nut of the whole thing: if something has changed history, that we no longer have that that ability to change it, um, then and it's and it doesn't get concentrated. So if it remains decentralized and secure, it changes all the rule books going forward. But it doesn't change people's desire to get a higher interest rate on their savings and to borrow at cheaper costs. But I, but I get that. So human nature, what you're saying, what you're saying is, is if we agree with both of these things, I agree with you looking through the history, history books, I agree with you, and I've talked about it extensively, that that's the, that is the risk. But if you had something that de was decentralized and secure and people held in self-custody, then what that would mean is as people played these games, these leverage games, one and you had deflation into a market, then the higher interest rate and the higher, uh, just like what happened with FTX and everything else, they would blow up faster. And if, if people remained in self-custody, so if you remain decentralized and secure, I'm not saying that that's a guarantee because there's so many powers that are going to try to centralize it. But if you remain decentralized and secure, it changes all of what you're talking about going forward. Let me give an example. Let's just say that I own X amount of Bitcoin and we're in a world where, uh, the world that you're referring to, and, I'm, yeah. and I complete and I carry 100% of that Bitcoin in my back pocket. So it's completely yeah. decentralized, but that's my entire net worth. That's my savings. Yeah. I'm going to want to get a return on that. I know, even with deflation, even though it is increasing in value, I get it. So, it's not going to be increasing okay. by a point where I don't want a return on that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to find a fiduciary who's willing to take that responsibility. Go, you, go ahead. You want to? Yeah, because the, because that's important. It, 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 full, f, until there, perfect. But what you're saying now is I am going to try to trade a return. Is that is above the free market by trusting somebody else to get me a higher return, mm -hmm. right? And I'm going to centralize by doing it. Yep. I agree with you. There's a whole bunch of people will, that will do that, just like that. Just did it on on FTX, just to try to get a, a higher return. And I also believe they will get wiped out because the real return rate. By the way, right now, right now, most people don't know this yet. But you can make about a three to five percent. It's not yield because it comes from free fees on Lightning, holding non-custodial Bitcoin. You can hold it decentralized yourself and make three to five percent. And I would say that's the true rate of return on the free market with deflation. So deflation, Bitcoin. That means Bitcoin is going to go up in price relative to fiat currency, and people can get it yield is from fees it's not yield but a real rate of return on bitcoin now that you couldn't do that a year ago two years ago but but these instruments based on the new new economic system are emerging and more people will will i would say take the true yield instead of the instead of the leveraged trusting somebody else to centralize you are right that a free market will emerge and a whole bunch of people will promise higher returns to try to centralize your Bitcoin. And, and I am right 
that if it stays decentralized and secure, if people understand the game that's going to be played, it's inevitable. Yeah, so let's go back to the 1800s, and you could add full reserve banking back then. Uh, you had to put your gold in the bank, but you could have chosen yeah. to put your gold in a full reserve bank, and we didn't see those. Why? Because the full reserve bank said, hey, if that guy's going to charge you to hold your gold or maybe pay you 1%, I'll pay you 3 4%. And is there higher risk? Sure. But people chose that over and over and over again. So I don't know why they yeah. wouldn't choose that in the future. So, so what I what I suspect um, going going back to those times, what I would suspect is more people know the difference today. I will tell you that most Bitcoiners that I know wouldn't be trusting to centralize their Bitcoin, and more tools are going to be open to be able to to give those people the power to generate uh, economic growth on their own. Right, but if we're talking about a world where Bitcoin is being used as a global currency, now all of a sudden it's not just Bitcoiners, you know, the, these crazy guys like us talking about Bitcoin and utilizing it. <laughs> it's, it's the average Joe and Jane. And the average yeah, Jane can, Jane, I, can I, I give some context here, sure, George? Sure. I'll give some context here. So uh, previously I had a sponsor called BlockFi who used to offer yield on their Bitcoin. I promoted them on my podcast. I used them myself. I held Bitcoin with them. Uh, and they originally offered a pretty good yield. It was around 6% and then 5%. It dropped. It gradually dropped till it got to, you were getting less than 1% and there was a limit to how much Bitcoin you could hold with them to get that. And then eventually they collapsed. But at the time, I, I told myself, this is great. You can get yield in your Bitcoin. And then when they blew up and people lost lots of money and lots of Bitcoin, I actually realized that the return for me, and this is my simple way I look at it, the return for me is the growth in the value of the Bitcoin and that's worth more than the yield risk of the the risk of having the counterparty risk of trying to get yield. So I still want the Bitcoin, but I didn't want to take the counterparty risk to get additional yield. In some ways, for me, the yield is the growing value of the Bitcoin over time versus the falling value of my fiat. Does that make sense to you, Jeff? Yeah, it, it does. Yeah, I, think it's, equation, though, Peter, couple, I think that's a yeah. great example. But that equation, you might be attaching uh, a appreciation to Bitcoin that might not be realistic in the world that Jeff is talking about. Because it, it, in that, see right now, Bitcoin is, let's say a risk asset or it trades like a risk asset. Uh, so you could, in your mind, you're thinking, wow, I, I could be missing out on a 25% return uh, annually here. That's how much Bitcoin can go up, maybe even more. But in the world that Jeff is talking about, Bitcoin might not uh, appreciate that much against goods and services. You would have deflation, but going back to the late 1800s, you know, we had, uh, I think from 1880 to 1900, we had about 20% deflation. So you would see Bitcoin with a lot less volatility. Well, I guess it would have no volatility, right? But even relative to goods and services, it would be appreciating in value, but not 50% per year or 25% per year. You look at maybe a two or 3% per year. So if you knew that your Bitcoin was only going to appreciate by that much, would you still have the same attitude? That would be my question to you. Uh, should we really be separating kind of almost different uh, uh, Bitcoin epochs? And essentially, we have very early high growth phase now. Oh, yeah. Then we kind of maybe have transitional period yeah. with lower growth. And then if we reach what Jeff thinks, which is hyper Bitcoinization, it's a, an entirely new kind of world we're living in yeah so yes and i totally agree with that but but it, but if you play that forward on what's happening if you just said that's why i keep just going back to first principles and simplifying this the question that george is actually raising is would i trade would i do what peter did and tra and leverage my stuff on blockchain or blo block fi and would they go broke or would somebody go broke because the, of the games that was somebody was always going to give you more margin and you would chase the margin and and there will be tons of people that get wiped out because of that and tons of companies that get wiped out because of that and human nature will drive that block black rock is going to do an ETF some people are going to put the put it in there that's going to be a centralizing function and there's going to be a whole bunch of these and if these games are played on top of this and it breaks the decentralization security I would say George is right I suspect that won't happen. And I suspect that won't happen because of things like this conversation. Um, and, and if you just follow first principles, prices follow the marginal cost of production, exponentially increasing productivity, and if it stays decentralized and secure, meaning if people self-custody and it stays decentralized and secure, 
and don't play the don't play as many of these games it effectively is going to wipe out people that are playing these games and keep on going so what you're talking about in the early epochs versus the later epochs is the exact same trend that is saying and that is repricing today's global wealth of call it 900 trillion into 21 million and that'll come and it'll feel like but most people are measuring from the from the well from their US system or Argentina system or whatever debasement they're taking on their currency they're measuring bitcoin in their currency so what it's actually saying is they're trading bitcoin they're traders right and what's actually happening is bitcoin is repricing it all and so so the speed of when you're talking about the epochs you're talking about the speed of repricing and that speed of repricing is going to be changing over time because currencies could let's let's use an example i use often in argentina how many it's not like there's 100% bitcoiners why not there's so in this case george is right right they got 120% inflation and everybody is leaning into the system thinking there's a fix from within the system and they just got rug pulled on their currency and then, and then because of that currency devaluation, it'll look, investment will race in, take advantage of cheap labor. Um, the, people will f- be fooled into that again, and then they'll get rug pulled again. And each time through those, the, those, that thing happening all around the world, it's going to create more and more Bitcoiners. But the, what, the repricing that we're talking about is there's a result of all these things happening. Yeah, but if you go to Argentina, what are they using, Jeff? They're using dollars. Yeah, and well, and, and, that, but, but, and, 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 and Bitcoin and Tether. Gotten rug pulled. And I'm not saying yeah. that, it, that it's a panacea. I'm not saying it's, it's great, but I am saying that that's part of the network effect that the dollar has is that you go to Turkey, which I've been there recently, you go to Argentina and you look in the cash register and they're not using Turkish lira and Argentinian pesos. It's full of dollars. And, and, it, and it makes sense, you know, if you're them. I totally agree with that. And in, in fact, it gives the system more strength, right? Because all of those areas that are defaulting or debasing are making uh, their currencies cheaper in the U.S. Uh, relation and allowing the U.S. to export more inflation around the world. Um, and strengthening. So network effects of something like the dollar don't end overnight. This is a, something I totally That's going to be one, that, in my opinion, is probably the biggest challenge that Bitcoin faces as far as taking it to its its last bucket or epoch, whatever you want to call it, to where it becomes uh, the global currency. Is just, we've never seen a network as powerful as the US dollar ever in human history. And so, and, and, but then and it's a lot, if you ask, that, you know, for Americans, it's hard for them to understand because their uh, expenses are denominated in dollars and therefore they see their expenses go up, they see the dollar lose value. But if your expenses are denominated in another currency, such as the Colombian peso where I'm right now, uh, holding dollars, you actually would have increased your purchasing power relative to local goods and services because uh, until recently, uh, the dollar had appreciated so much relative to the peso. It appreciated more than the rate of local inflation. And so that, that's, that's very, very powerful, especially when that's happened over decades and it's generational. Even if the dollar loses, let's say 1% relative to local goods and services uh, annually, that, that's something that people can depend on. So I'm not here to cheerlead for the dollar or anything, but that is part of the, the probabilities, right? That's part of the whole equation when you're trying to think about when or if Bitcoin could replace something like the dollar. But one thing I also wanted to throw in there because we were talking about getting a percentage, an interest rate on your savings, but it's not just that. I think it's the debt side that would really, there'd be a lot of demand for fractional reserve because you know I think people are still gonna wanna borrow money. They're still gonna wanna borrow Bitcoin. They wanna buy a house, they don't have the money. And even if it's not fractional reserve, you know, if it's full reserve, they're gonna be paying a much higher interest rate where you've got a bank that comes out and says, listen, we'll do this fractional reserve stuff. And we've done it in the past, it wasn't a big deal. And instead of having to pay an 8% mortgage, now you only have to pay a 5% mortgage. So I think people are gonna to gravitate towards that as well. So I think you will have demand from the wanting to get a higher interest rate 
on your savings, and then also because it's cheaper, uh, it's it, it's cheaper to borrow. And I we I think that's one of the main reasons. Uh, there's a lot of them, but one of the main reasons why we see so much dollar denominated debt right now. You know, why does Argentina, Argentina, excuse me, have so much dollar denominated debt? Because it's cheap, because they can borrow dollars at three or four percent when they can they can borrow pesos at whatever 15 20 percent and so that that entrenches that that network and i think that's what people will gravitate towards yeah george you're right on on some of this but but if you're denominating in bitcoin you can already see what's happening right so th- 3 years ago my my lake house uh cost uh 300 bitcoin my lake house has gone up about 20% in those three years, maybe more than that. And now my lake house is 50 Bitcoin, right? So when you're talking about, I'm going to lever into a different system, you're actually saying, I'm going to pay way more into the, uh, so, and, and all the, and all the debt and everything else. Whereas if you're talking about Bitcoin, you're actually repricing everything over time. Yeah, I understand. But if I want to buy your lake house for 50 Bitcoin, and I don't have the 50 Bitcoin, I want to borrow it. And I want to borrow it at the cheapest interest rate. Yeah, and 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 you will try, or you will, or you will keep on saving in Bitcoin and buy it outright. Yeah, but who does that, Jeff? I mean, I, I I get in an ideal world, I get it. Maybe the Japanese do that to a greater degree than Americans, but as, as Americans, I just uh, to think that we we're going to transition into this world in in twenty years when no one's going to want debt or no one's going to want an, a, a car loan or a mortgage. I, I just don't think that's realistic. This is actually why in, in this kind of American focus, because American focus is the US dollar and it's had so much network effect that we take for granted. I've, my entire life has been building networks and, and technology and understanding network effects. My, it, it's, it's how I came up to the thesis that I did and understanding how powerful network effects. In fact, 70% of all value created in, uh, in technology companies is, is due to a network effect. The US dollar has the same network effect and it drives of all of our uh, purchasing, totally understand. And, and so what ends up happening though is what ends up happening to a monopoly with network effects once the network effects start ending, right, is people don't see it. And they do the same things, same thing that Kodak did inventing the digital camera. And that what ends up happening is the network effect moves to the people furthest away from the monopoly. So what's happening right now through Bitcoin is it's moving because I've never seen something in human history, I haven't seen an example of something that offers way faster, cheaper, and safer that is lost, that is open to anybody to play, that is ever lost against a monopoly, ever. And what is happening right now at Bitcoin, why it's moving from the bottom up, why you'd see El Salvador move to it first, why you're seeing all these other countries move to it first, is because it's enhancing their their ability to compete. And you're going to see this, and, and I see it because I'm at, in, at the nexus of that all around the world. I know Peter's traveled around the world seeing this as well. And when you see this impacting communities at a level outside of what we're talking about in the what protects the monopoly, you understand it's unstoppable. If it stays decentralized and secure, it's unstoppable. And so you have a new, more powerful network effect that's emerging from the bottom up. And, and what I would say is most people are misunderstanding vastly, dramatically, what that means to the existing network effect. Not that it won't it'll end tomorrow. I don't, I, I totally agree with you there. But, but by the time, as you have something that more, gets more and more powerful with every node and every user that joins it, it becomes more powerful to the point a monopoly can't, can't avoid it. Yeah, but people let, let me throw my context. <laughs> yeah, let, let me throw throw my context, then then put, put a question to to you, uh, uh, George. So, in the last couple of months, I've been to both Argentina and Lebanon. Yeah, uh, I, I I try to go to two of the countries that uh, have got some of the worst inflationary issues, and to make a documentary to understand uh, what is happening. And and quite rightly, as you've both alluded to, most people don't want Bitcoin; they want dollars. And the reason they want dollars is it's the closest thing 
they have of a real world experience to their local currency in the way it operates and they use it, but it's stable. Mm. So it's 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 not volatile. The problem with both of these countries is so many people have been pushed below the poverty line. They can't afford to think about something like Bitcoin and, how, and its volatility and spend time on the technology and understanding it. Most of them are just trying to live day to day. So they want a dollar and they want to protect their income and grow their business. But what I have found in these countries is there is more openness to Bitcoin than, say, I would find in the UK with my friends. And I think what that is, is Bitcoin is slow to adopt. But in these countries, there are some people who are skipping the dollar step or they're, they're doing the dollar step alongside Bitcoin. And, but I do think a lot of Bitcoiners have this wrong in thinking like Bitcoin can fix Lebanon. No, it can't. Property rights, rule of law, security, and a stable currency. But what was really interesting about Lebanon, it's now a cash dollar economy. There's no banking infrastructure. It's a cash dollar economy. And people have found a way. My question to you really is, George, is that one of the interesting things about Bitcoin, it's kind of unstoppable in that it just comes at you. So is there a possibility that whilst people may want to borrow money, that Bitcoin forces a new world where it just changes that and they just can't, and we have to adapt to the world that this almost organic protocol creates? No, but then the free market's going to provide it, Peter. If Peter, if uh, if people, excuse me, want uh, lending, if they want fractional reserve banking, if they want cheaper interest rates, if they want to be paid higher on their savings, then someone's going to step in and offer that to them. And uh, that's just the way the free market works. And like I was, the point I was making earlier, historically, we just see this happen over and over and over again. So in the future, and I, I get the three main components here. You've got a set amount. You've got uh, the ability to keep your purchasing power in your back pocket. In other words, decentralization. And uh, Jeff makes a great point, and Lynn has made this several times as well, about instant settlement. That you might not need as much credit if you can settle instantly compared to the gold standard when you had to ship gold, you know, from one place to the other, and it took three months or so. But again, I think it, it that human nature is going to kick in, that greed, that desire, and we're just going to. Although we might move to a Bitcoin standard as a result of the fiat system completely collapsing, uh, eventually in 30, 40, 50 years, you're going to land right back where we are today. Uh, you're going to have those derivatives. You're going to have uh, the, the the Bitcoin money supply growing exponentially because of governments and people uh, wanting to vote for stimulus and whatnot. Uh, I just think it's. I think that is uh, as close to inevitable as possible. I wish it wasn't that way, but I just. Where does that I, stimulus I, come I, from? I, I actually don't think that that's right. I, I, I think that that's where that that's where we disagree. But but again, we're talking about probabilities here, yeah. and we're talking about human nature and what, what what's happening, and so we can disagree around the ed edge there and and see what's happening. And I would say, what I would say is, in in when I look at how few people in the world are good at seeing second and third order um, problems or opportunities out of something that's changed, and how f how few people kind of predict the future and they predict their present forward. You get into you get into uh, most times these things being wrong. So you have to kind of update your probabilities with what would happen um, uh, uh, here with uh, taking those in. But it's human hardwiring, Jeff. I'm not talking about something as far as technology or whatnot. I'm just talking about I, human I, greed. I, I, I know. Changes. I, so I get what what I'm saying is is I think what you're doing in this is I think you're taking, in fact. I, I would say some of some of the world that you're describing today, governments have all this power, they're going to have all this power and everything else, um, that this is the way it looks and we will make sure that happens it, because we reinforce that system and we give them the power. Everything we do, we give them the power and we give them the power because of this, similar, similar to what you're saying. If the, if the free market is deflationary period. And we have inflationary m money. That means we don't actually live in a free market. So what you're talking about is, is we will vote. So the free market takes it and then we will vote to abandon the free market and give government more control to be able to protect us from the free market. That's that's kind of what I'm you're just saying that in that world, I think people are still going to vote for higher taxation. 
And I think as, as time goes on, especially if that wealth is consolidated, if that, if that wealth is centralized in people's back pocket and not everyone has access to it, then I think that's going to increase the probability that people vote for more government handouts and therefore taxes increase even in Bitcoin. I mean, I, I like to point out that uh, right now, uh, at least back in 2015, these are the last numbers that I have, so I assume it's much, much higher now. The amount of tax revenue, I'm not, I'm not talking about spending, I'm talking about revenue uh, that the government receives as a percentage of GDP is over 30% when you look at state and local and federal. And I think now it's over 40%. So, so it, why, it why has is nothing that? to do with deficits. It has nothing to do no, with no, money no. printing or bonds or, or, or anything like that. This is just tax revenue. And to your point, Jeff, people voted for that. So, so, so why would they not vote for that in the future? And I think that pertains, because a lot of people are saying, George, how are you connecting the dots there? I think that pertains to inflation because as government spending as a percent of GDP goes up, I think that in and of itself is inflationary, potentially even with a fixed money supply. But again, I think this always goes back, Jeff, to in the future, people are going to want to borrow money. They're just going to want to borrow money and they're going to want to borrow it at the, lower, at the lowest interest rate. And they're going to want to get the highest return that, that they deem as safe on their savings. And I, I just don't see how technology or Bitcoin or anything on the planet Earth changes that. Okay, hear me hear me out then um, on this, because I think in this, this is the crux of where where we disagree um, on, on what I what I uh, what I believe is going to happen, which is inevitable. Um, the if it, this stays decentralized and secure, and we can't negotiate with that decentralization and security. It's just the next block, next block, next block. Then it is, as we said, if it stays decentralized and secure, you can assign a probability to that. Then what I said will happen, and it'll blow up, and and the existing system will keep blowing up. And but and we will in, vote in that, in that world, Jeff. People don't want mortgages, right? I'm not. I'm not saying. I'm, let's just let's just stop. Okay. It doesn't matter whether they want or not. Right. Right. It doesn't actually matter because what it matters is as they take more mortgages, and if mortgage and, and if prices house prices climb rel relative to that, and deflation is a forced uh, part of the market, meaning pr uh, uh, prices fall the marginal cost of production, and house prices don't receive uh, an infl a premium to store your wealth. And they they start falling to to a utility value, then it means that one side of that other, one person or the other, probably both, are going to be wiped out in counterparty risk, no matter what, right? And that's going to happen. So I agree with you that people are going to do that. I agree with you largely, but it doesn't matter if it stays decentralized and secure. It doesn't matter. They will get wiped out. Someone but will get wiped, get wiped out. But they didn't get wiped out to the point where it mattered in the late eighteen hundreds. But again, Why? this because, is because see, because what you're saying is it's in the back pocket. I get it, but now we're just comparing full reserve and fractional reserve. So, so, so let's why just did keep, fractional let's just reserve keep, went out? But let's just keep going because there's so much power in governments to be able to but save. But people us. wanted fractional right. reserve, Jeff. It wasn't the government I, I, mandating. I, I know free banking. But, I mean, you know that the so, government so, wasn't involved there. But hear me out. When free banking collapses. And then, then people sit, tell the government to be able to save them, and regulation comes in, and that, then you have bigger banks that creates more risk and not free markets that get worse and worse. So you're right. I'm not arguing that. I'm talking if this stays decentralized and secure, it doesn't matter if you're right. It doesn't. They're going to get wiped out. It's go, and it's going to continue. And you don't think Bitcoin the government's going to bail them out? And 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 the government and the government is and then the government just like the government bails out everyone in two thousand eight and centralizes control and because and because there's not the tax revenue to do that, but, but, the, people, but they have to expand the government to be able to do it. and pointed out that right now we've got let's just say forty percent of GDP in tax revenue that people are voting so, for. So I get I get it and and so if you're if you're running an inflationary monetary system. Against a deflationary, against a deflationary real world that's imposing physical restraints and physics restraints, then you're going to get wiped out faster. Um, and whether you're a government getting wiped out faster, if, unless you're, maybe the the short term debt cycle turns into long term debt cycles, turns into the government debt cycle as you kick up debt that can't be repaid, and then what do you do over time? 
you monetize that debt. Why do you monetize that debt? Because you, you because if you let a deflationary collapse happen, uh, everything would break. And so, would we? Would you vote? I ask Bitcoiners all, all the time this. Would they vote to have their income, to have their real income go up each year, even though their uh, uh, their income might come down each yeah. year? But they um, but but would but their purchasing power would increase each year. Would they vote for that government? And most people would say no, no chance. I'll wait for for prices to come down, then I'll maybe get a little bit less and I'll get more. So I agree with you. Human nature is biased in the system that we live in, and they'll vote for people who will tell them. And what that means, what that what I just said means is, we vote for pe people we know are lying to us. And we're stealing and we're taking away our individual rights and freedoms as we transfer more control to people that are lying to us. It's just theater on top of a broken system. And and we knowingly do that. And that I agree with. But this is imposing physical imposing restraints to that. Do you think people do truly vote knowing that? I think I think you understand the theatre. I think you understand the economic arguments, but I think the vast majority of people have no idea. I don't think a lot of people know where the money comes from. They just think the government has endless money to solve their problems. I think this is one of the issues now, is that I think the majority of voters don't understand and they think voting for an alternative party is going to change things. Whereas, actually, it's successive administrations, whether it's the UK, Europe, whether it's the US, Canada, whether it's Japan, Henry. Canada, that, that have actually successive administrations from different political parties that have done exactly the same thing to the money supply. They have to. That's not my here, question. But, but that takes us down a whole other rabbit hole. The banks have. Yeah. The banks but, my, have my, my, but my, well, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's happened under their watch. I mean, my question is still the same, though, Jeff. You think we knowingly vote for this, but do you think enough people actually know are, are voting knowing what's really happening? I think you're you're starting to people are starting to uh, to to look outside what's happening. I think Bitcoin and and what we're doing Bitcoin is part of that kind of early knowledge sharing. And once you see it, you can't unsee it. Now, um, and that and that is building. You know how early we are on Bitcoin. This is this is something that's very, and we're talking about this future playing out. So, um, so I understand all of these uh, concerns about and how it's looked for the last five thousand years, and how would how would this look different? I totally get that. But the um, how early we are on this is is I think driving this because most people are carrying their baggage from the existing system that it's everything they know, and 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 the smarter you are at that existing system. The more ingrained you are, even if you hate it, even if all the things that you don't like about it, that you're concentrating more power in government all the time, this the more that you know that, the more, likely more you are. It's harder to see what the impo imposition of 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 this uh, of these rules creates for new rules. How the emergent complex behavior of society emerges on top of a different set of rules. That slowly transitions, and I think what we're seeing is just the early bridge to the other side. And depending on what view of the world you're going to be living through, if you're living through the fiat lens, and all of these things are happening, and there are only we have four hundred trillion dollars of debt in the world that's insolvent, it's completely insolvent. So the only way to pay that back is financial repression or velocity. Yeah, but, they, but 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 financial repression, but the economy. We we talk about technology all the time. Look at art of what's happening with artificial intelligence. It's more deflationary. So so what it, what's giving rise to the debt and the debt that's not able to repay is you have to over you're going to have to grow economies faster than that, and that is a deflationary impact. So you're, what, what's happening is you're adding monetary supply to pretend that can be repaid, and it can't. It's financial repression. The only way to financial repress people is to control the narratives of communications and lock them into a burning building. And so the confusion right now all around the world 
and with, where whether where you're going with CBDCs, where you're going with different political parties saying this and dividing pe- people, is out of the exact same thing. It has to get worse. And if you're measuring the world from that fiat lens, it will get worse. Now, but look, fiat lens has nothing to do with in 2020. We have a global pandemic and people want stimmy checks. So let's just assume that we're in the Bitcoin standard world, right? It's not going to eradicate war. It's not going to eradicate disease. It's not going to eradicate famine. We're, we're, we're human beings. We're, we're imperfect creatures in an imperfect world. The shit's going to hit the fan. And what we've seen over and over and over again, when shit hits the fan, no matter how great your system is, people put that system on pause. You know, going right back to the Roman thing that we were talking about, how did Julius Caesar become a dictator, right? It, it's because they they the, the shit hit the fan in Rome. And they said, yeah, let's go ahead in this Republic thing. Let's go ahead and put it on hold for a moment. And we'll just give uh, Caesar uh, dictatorial power for the next 10 years because we have to. And it's, it's you look at World War I, World War II, the Civil War uh, with the Legal Tender Act of 1862. Again, look at what happened in 2020. If that type of thing happens again, regardless of what your monetary system is, people are going to want to kick the can down the road. People are going to want a quick fix. And if increasing the currency supply supply is that quick fix, that's what you're that's what people are going to demand. They're going to take the pitchforks and the torches. Per- perfect. I agree with you. Perfect. That will happen. We know a whole bunch of monetary easing is coming. We know if they tighten this, that you're going to move into, they continue to tighten. Eventually, you're going to move into deflationary spiral. You and I both know that. We know that uh, uh, massive liquidity is coming at some point, might be 10 months away, but at some point, there's going to be massive liquidity. Um, In either case, Bitcoin is just a ledger. It doesn't care. All of this stuff going on, that you're talking about, it doesn't care. It's repricing this. But we're talking about increasing the, the currency supply. We're talking about increase. We're talking about creating paper Bitcoin. It, no, 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 no. We're talking about increasing the. We're, we're right now. We're talking about increasing the currency supply. Because what will people do? They're not going to say increase increase the currency supply of Bitcoin. And P.S. If they did, good luck. They're going to say increase the currency supply to make to to make sure I have enough money. Yeah. Which will transfer more power to governments. Which will, which will, those governments will be able to surveil you and do anything you want to be able to change it, and so, you, so that is going to happen in the existing system. You and I both. No, agree no, on in that. the Bitcoin system. No, why in the Bitcoin system? Because if you have a global pandemic, Jeff, if you have World War Three in the Bitcoin system, and the the people in the government see creating more currency units as a solution, that's what's going to happen. If people are that, if people are that scared shitless. They're not going to sit there and have some philosophical view about the monetary system. They're, they're going to want it fixed ASAP, regardless of what the long-term consequences are. So th- this is where I think you're bringing your uh, knowledge of the existing system and the and into the new and not Bitcoin is repricing this uh, system. It has 21 fi- million fixed. It doesn't matter what this system does. If you're measuring the world from it and, and, and all of this stuff that's going to happen in the existing system, you're right. Bitcoin is fixed. If you're arguing that one day, because what would happen on the Bitcoin system? What would happen in the Bitcoin system is government would have to get smaller. Why? It would have to. What, Why? Because, be, people because didn't it, vote that way, Jeff. The government would not have to get smaller. They just I Bitcoin. know. It's just Bitcoins. That El, Salvador, El Salvador's government just got smaller. But, but they didn't um, have to. That's because the people voted that way. And this goes back to, you know, people always ask me, George, what's the solution? What's the solution? If Bitcoin's not the solution, what is it? Unfortunately, the only solution we have is convincing people that small government is the way you have to vote. And if you vote for big government, regardless of the monetary system, you're, you're, you're going to get inflation. Even, I would argue you're likely going to get inflation, consumer price inflation, even if you have a very limited or a fixed money supply or money supply that grows very slowly. So what do you think? So, so right now, governments like El Salvador and others that are coming, what do you think is happening to people who are moving there and voting with their Bitcoin? What's, what, what's happening is the economies are more prosperous as a result of being more fiscally responsible, and 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 their government budgets are coming down as a result uh, 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 of that. That is what's going to 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 attract my Bitcoin. I will just tell you, because I could move anywhere. 
um, and I just get up on a plane and go anywhere, I would not go to a place that is saying, we're going to charge you 40% taxes to be able to carry on all these this nonsense. I know a whole bunch of people in the existing system will, though. That That's the point. This imposes a change, and it imposes a change from the bottom up to governments as, as well. It imposes a change on a systematic, emergent, complex behavior that you couldn't impose because people wouldn't do it unless you had a system that imposed that change. Okay, so again, when you get a crisis situation, even in El Salvador, and people see the solution as going off the Bitcoin standard, they're going to go off the Bitcoin standard. Or what they're going to do is the exact same thing that we did in 1862. They're going to say, yeah, we've got this gold stuff. And I realize you guys like that. But now what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to start taking these green pieces of paper. And if you don't, we're going to put Perfect. you in jail. Perfect. And then, and when they did, a whole bunch, if they did, a whole bunch of people would say, okay, I'm out of El Salvador now. I'm going to somewhere who treats treats me and my money. Uh, uh, but, but Jeff, let, let's be honest. Are you married? I am. Okay, do you have kids? Yes. How old are your kids? 19, 17, 15. Okay, so I'm assuming they're in schools that they've gone to for quite some time. You guys have chosen those schools carefully. What? What? So why don't you move to, to uh, El Salvador right now? So I've been there. I visited. Yeah. Um, your wife and, a big and fan of El Salvador? What's Is that? your wife a big fan? Your kid's a big fan of El Salvador? Yeah, they, they enjoyed it a And lot. they want to go to school there? Um. So, so George, right you now where I'm again, going with this, right? I, 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 can I just jump in here? I yeah. think I, I think George is making a good point here in that, look, I'm in the UK and I'm paying over 50% tax. Uh, and that doesn't include all the other taxes I have to pay and the tax I'll pay when I die. Um, but my kids are in school here. I could move to Monaco or I could move to El Salvador. Jeff I'm could, not. Jeff, We're happy here. My kids Jeff here. and I could both and, move to Puerto Rico uh, and pay zero. And tax, interestingly, we, he, 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 we could find examples of people who have or who will do. But I don't think the majority, you're not going to suddenly see 60 million people from the UK up their sticks and go down. I think it's usually an edge case where people actually make that change. I think he's making a fair point. Yeah, what I would say is, I actually don't understand that point. And, and, and this, is, this is why. Right now, today in Canada, and I, I still have friends here, schools here. By the way, George, we just traveled for the last two years. We took our kids and put them in online school, and we traveled for the uh, last two years. Are you in Canada, Everywhere. Jeff? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. And so, uh, but I still have lots of friends here and everything else. But I have decreased my, I would say, my investment here and, and houses, real estate, everything, uh, investment here in, in favor of where I'm building to, the world I'm building to, what's happening on Bitcoin. As a result of what I see is happening, I've also seen areas in the world, and I'm looking at having the flexibility of golden visa opportunity in different areas of the world where, that I could move. Because, because if you understand what's going to happen in the existing world, is it's not going to look the same as we thought it looked before. You're going to have to retain flexibility in the world we're moving into. Um, and, and so, so if you're talking about me specifically, um, we just spent two years on the road. Um, I, um, I'm investing and I'm, and I'm on the leading edge of this all over the world, seeing where it's going and that there's lots of different opportunities for myself, my family and my capital. And I'm, and I'm, re I'm retaining flexibility right now. This is still home. But would I would I choose uh, would I choose that if things changed here? Of course I would, and I would suggest that other people should start taking a hard look at that. Yeah, too. I think the the main point there though is even in a perfect society with a perfect monetary system that's booming, you, you're going to have hits to that. You're going to have uh, tsunamis. You're going to have let's say the Cerveza sickness. You're going to have a war. And it is true you might be able to pack up and and, and go somewhere else, but a lot of people won't want to do that and therefore i believe just looking at five thousand years of human history that they're going to choose to let's say manipulate that perfect monetary system that they have in order to alleviate any short-term pain and that over time doing that over and over and over again it's like a death by a thousand cuts pretty soon over decades you get to a point where you're it, the, the world or even that economy looks very similar to the one that we have right now so rule of money is superordinate to rule of law. We, you would agree with that, right? 
it's going to gravitate to rule of law for the most part, yeah. So if it didn't look like that, the places with the most broken money would have the best rule of law. Rule of law is subservient to money. So if you have broken money, then rule of law just breaks faster and faster and faster. Um, and, and so, so, and why there's so much power in money in trying to destroy money is exactly the same thing. I just say, if you have, if you control the money, you control the world. And people don't know how important that is. And it, they don't know how important it is for their own life and safety and, and work and everything else. And, and so what you just described as this gets worse is different places on the world in the world look like different countries in Africa right now. And they get worse and worse and worse. And some countries operating on a Bitcoin standard get better and better and better. And, and that is the world we're going to move through in the next little, it, for, the, for, uh, for the foreseeable future. It's, it's kind of frightening in some cases, but if you're on the right system, if, I, I tend to ask myself this question, a really simple question to try to get out of the noise. What would life look like? What would the emergent complex behavior of all of our actions look like on a system that required theft in the base layer of money? Who would win? Who would lose? What would it look like over time? Um, and if that theft had to get worse and worse to protect a financial system that was based on a lie, what would it look like? And then what would the emergent complex behavior look like of society on a system? Because all it is is an honest ledger. What would that look like? Sorry, can I just throw in the real world examples for context? Because I've just been, as I said, Argentina and Lebanon. They've both been through... Uh, 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 you know, the, uh, Argentina, I can't remember when it was, but look, uh, I always pronounce this incorrectly, Le Curlito, where basically they woke up one day and the government stolen all their money. Lebanon's been through the same. Not only have they had their deposits stolen from the bank accounts, but they've also had uh, their currency destroyed by massive inflation. And have they seen a mass exodus of people? Not really. But you you see half an exodus, and the half of the exodus you see is the youth leaving. So that's a pattern I've seen. That the youth or the parents are trying to get their children to leave. So in Argentina, you know, people are going to Australia, the UK, America, because there's no future. You know, they can't get jobs. If you can get jobs, they can't afford a house, and there's high inflation. Exactly the same things happen in Lebanon. The diaspora is huge, but the, but almost anyone who can afford to get their kid out of Lebanon to America, Canada, somewhere else, they do. So there's kind of like Jeff, what you're saying is it's kind of half right. Like it's the youth that tends to leave but the older people tend to stay. And that, that's real world examples where everyone's had all their money stolen and the economy destroyed. So when you say people may leave, actually, you know, we can see they don't. Sometimes they will put up with the worst situations and, and, and stay Peter, in the country they love. Peter, I'd also point out, going back to 2020, I think even for the average Joe, I don't think you need a PhD in economics to, to know that those stimulus checks were going to create consumer price inflation. And, and you had literally zero. <laughs> Paul Krugman didn't know. Zero. <laughs> okay, fair point. <laughs> but, but no, seriously, anyone in the Bitcoin space, or I think anyone with their just some common sense can say, okay, we're increasing the amount of currency units in the United States by 20 or 25%. That's probably going to have some long-term negative effects. You know, that's probably going to create some consumer price inflation. But yet you had ze almost zero people say, yeah, I don't want that stimulus check. Or yeah, that, that PPP loan for $5 million. Nah, I, I don't want that. I don't want that because I know that's going to create consumer price inflation. Nobody said that. Nobody said that. And that, that I think that really illustrates my point better than anything. Mind you, if you say that same point, that same point was the point. Ross Stevens, Mike Saylor, uh, Michael Saylor, a whole bunch of others found religion on Bitcoin and started advancing uh, advancing that. And that's my point. My point is the more this happens, the more volatile this gets, the more people that are coming over to understand the new system and the more people that are building on the new system. George, I wish, and maybe this is offline a different thing, I wish you could see what I see on the type of things that are being built on top of this layer two and layer three now and how fast that's going to emerge 
And when I say fast, I'm not saying our, I'm not saying it changes our time frame as far as tomorrow everything changes to Bitcoin standard. I'm saying I couldn't I couldn't imagine putting my money anywhere else because my return is going to be so high and not just a return on in 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 capital, but a return on my time working with kind of the best people in the world building a system that works for everybody. It's incredible. Um, and if you saw what that looked like and what that meant to to how you're measuring Bitcoin today versus what is is building right now that's going to be brought forward, it might change your mind on some of this. Well, and again, I want to be very clear, and that's why I tried to compartmentalize right at the beginning of the conversation, that let's just assume for a moment that Bitcoin never, ever, ever became a global currency. Let's assume for a moment that they did that we fractional reserve lent it. They, yeah. There's paper Bitcoin. There's more than 21 million. That uh, all these things that we're, uh, that I'm talking about. Let's say that comes to fruition. But let's also assume that Bitcoin gives us the ability to transact outside of the system. Even in that world, I think there is massive, massive, massive value. And Bitcoin is sensational. And Bitcoin will, in my opinion, overachieve, right? E even if, let's just assume it's inflationary. Let's assume it loses 5% per year uh, in its purchasing power relative to goods and services, but it still gives us a way to transact outside of the system. I still think that's a win. I still think that's a huge win. And I still think that in and of itself is worth people allocating you know time energy capital and maybe their lives into figuring out um because you know if if you look at that type of world a cbdc world where they're monitoring every single transaction and they control completely who gets credit and they're doing that based on narrative instead of merit and all these things that we are concerned with um again if you've got a release valve for that then this is this is fantastic. I mean, this is something that should be applauded, and this is basically winning the war, uh, even if uh, it loses purchasing power every single year. Mm, uh, George, are you really sure that many people care about that? Uh, it, it depends. You know, it go it goes back to how the government is utilizing it, right? So I think that if my base case actually is that the government utilizes this in the same way that it utilized the uh, the the I don't know what they're called the the passports. You know, you get the shot, you get the power. I want to keep it YouTube yeah. friendlier. Um, but if you had that, let's say, medicine passport in Texas, it, it didn't matter because no one was checking it. But in New York, it mattered a lot. Or in Canada, I think it it, it mattered a lot. You <laughs> had to have that, or you couldn't even go to a restaurant. You couldn't take your kids out. You couldn't do these things. So I think in a CBDC world in the United States, it could get to the point where everyone's got a social score, but in Texas, it really doesn't matter. But in New York, it really does. In California, it does. In Canada, it does. Australia. And then there's some parts of the world where I think that they're very, uh, that it's very draconian. Uh, but I think that's something that the people will vote for because it'll be presented to them as a way to protect them from disinformation and misinformation and all these evil characters like Russell Brand and, uh, you know, the, the bad actors. And it's a way to get people, it's a way to make Rumble go bankrupt. So we we don't have these people manipulating our, our the minds of our youth and whatnot. So I think that if it, if it goes too far in that type of world, then I do think people will push back and people will seek this out. Um, but but let's just assume for a moment you're right, Peter, and they don't. Let's assume that the majority of the average Joe and Janes continue to be plugged in to the matrix, if you will. Even if it allows those people, uh, let's just say 5% of the human population to unplug from the system, I still think that's a win. I, I still think course, that's, yeah. that's, that's huge. Yeah. So, George, this is the this is the piece, and I think this is probably where people say, do you have an alternative that... that they they probably say it in a different way uh, uh, way than maybe it comes across to kind of say I'm a Bitcoin maxi and when I say Bitcoin maxi it means I've done the work down to the sand on this to say how how would I decent I would try to disprove my hypothesis over and over and over and over again and not being able to 
um, and and realizing that Bitcoin is decentralized and secure is I wanted to spend more time building the world I wanted to see instead of yelling at the world that I saw. Um, and even in that, I would say, and I've said it a number of times on different podcasts, I was a hypocrite for a while because I held a bunch of wealth in, in Bitcoin. And so I was safe. But I was all of my money-making activities were in the fiat system. I was on a bunch of different boards in the fiat system and everything else. So 90 over 90% of my time, besides podcasts and such, were in the fiat system. I realized, huh, I'm exactly what you described before. I'm spending the time inside this system, making it stronger, while talking about a new system, talking about a new system. And why I started the venture capital company is to invest more of my time, all of my time, inside the system I wanted to see emerge. Because I can't get to the, I can't get to this, I can't get past this. I and I found it in myself too. I can't get past this. You're right about human nature, and most of the people on Twitter and, and maybe even on your podcasts and everything else, were were making a system stronger by yelling at the system. World Bank, the, all of these systems, they're, they're just taking all of the money that we make. Inside that system advances a system that takes away our individual rights and freedoms at a faster and faster rate. Um, and it has to, because that entire system is based on theft and nobody will vote for that system going through a, the deflationary spiral. So it has to. And, and what I realized is I could do that too, and I could spend a lot of my energy doing that, or I could just change my energy and I could put it into the system that started emerging the other way because it was the only way outside of that system that I had a, a way to, to, to solve the problem. Everything else strength, strengthened the existing system. No matter if, if I yelled at it, I would have more people saying, yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right. But they too would be strengthening, strengthening the existing system too. And what I realized, huh, I need to just exit and spend more time building the world I want to with the people I wanted to. Yeah, I just, I, I think there's, like I said, massive value in a parallel system, for sure. Uh, but I, I do see that parallel system evolving from a monetary I standpoint, from a monetary standpoint, similar to the system that we currently have. Now, the fact that it's, that it would be outside of the purview of the government, I think is, is huge. I think that's massive, and that in and of itself makes it worthwhile. Which means, but so, the, the, and I think the thing that that I have more confidence in, and you might have less confidence in, but you might, uh, if you, uh, maybe one day we'll meet on this, is my node isn't going to change the rules. I can tell you that for sure. Um, it, the it, my node is not going to have more than twenty one Bitcoin. And I know that with many, many other people that know the same thing. And that means it imposes that rule, that rule set on governments as well. And it imposes the free market on governments. So governments serve us instead of us serving them. And it, as the way it should, should look. Could, could I be wrong um, that a whole bunch of people change, decide to change Bitcoin to be able to centralize it and to produce a whole bunch of uh, a different monetary value on it, Potent, uh, I, I could be wrong. I suspect I'm not because of thing, conversations like this that, that move into kind of common knowledge of how important that is. Yeah. I mean, in my... Because, because it, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, just in my worldview, it's just like a thought experiment. I, I almost wish that, that Bitcoin would never be a global money. I, I almost wish that it would remain this in its own ecosystem. I, I hope that it evolves to the point where people can completely transact outside of the system if they so choose. But I hope that that system wouldn't take over the global monetary system because then you introduce all of these human flaws that I'm concerned about, right? Yeah. But if it stays it's in its own little esoteric ecosystem, then it, it's, it's got a, a lower chance of being, um, it, it's got a lower chance of 
what's the right word? Being, being you're saying being co-opted. Yeah. And, I, and I, yeah. I, I think, so what controls Bitcoin network? We do. And so, and, and so the, you have to advance a change to change something. You have to advance a change that is so powerful that it gets consensus. In fact, why are the entire altcoin space exists is because you couldn't build on Bitcoin. But and, but hold on, George, isn't isn't Bitcoin the job of Bitcoin to to eliminate the flaws of like humans and our poor decision making? Aren't the incentives structured in a way to eliminate that? That's my point. I don't think it ever will, Peter. I, I don't. I don't think it will. So if, if it just remains uh, an, a way for people to unplug from the current system, who so choose, I think that's probably its biggest win. Because if it grows bigger than that, that's when I see the problems really starting to arise that take us right back to this system that we're in right now. You know, as an example, if the United States government abandoned Bit, uh, the dollar and went to Bitcoin. Well, now all of a sudden, uh, you're being taxed in Bitcoin, all these other things. You could have that a similar type of surveillance, or at least the government spending, misallocating resources and whatnot. You wouldn't have the opportunity to unplug from the system. Whereas if the United States government stays on the dollar, and then we have this Bitcoin ecosystem that in 10 and 15 years allows people to complete, let's say, transact 90% outside of that system, outside of the purview of the government, then I think that's probably the, the best case scenario. Hold on, but you talk about trade-offs. I would take that trade-off. Um, which trade-off? The trade-off whereby I would rather live in an entire system that includes the government, which is Bitcoin-based, than feel like I need Bitcoin to be the outsider from the fiat space. But then just I take that as long as you realize what you're risking, because as long as you realize that, in my view, and Jeff might not agree with this, but in my view, you're likely going to have fractional reserve lending, which would increase the supply of Bitcoin. You're likely going to have uh, government spending pretty much at, at the same uh, percentage of GDP that it is now. You're, you're pretty much not going to get rid of any of the problems. Uh, that you have right yeah now. but is it is it not sorry is it just are we talking trying to are we talking in binaries here I, I don't i don't mind if it doesn't eliminate what i like the idea is trending down it's a bit like when i had my conversation with eric Voorhees and we talked about the size of government he's like don't talk to me about anarchism and zero government i just want government to just shrink by one percent you know is it more about the trajectory the incentives improve the trajectory of society so my point is if you don't change the attitude of people. I don't know how Bitcoin reduces the size of government. Now you can sit there and I'll, talk. I'll, 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 I'll tell you how. Let me be clear. Because people, your your listeners will automatically say, well, deficit spending, because the government can't print money. But what I'm referring to specifically is just the tax revenue that's that's generated. So that has nothing to do with okay. money printing. Okay. That has nothing to do. Let me throw in Jeff and leave it to you. I'm just yeah. gonna say one thing on there. The really interesting thing about living in the world of Bitcoin and meeting Bitcoin is is that I've seen countless people who, who have had their attitudes changed on so many things because of Bitcoin. It, it's kind of shifted the way you think about a lot of different things. This is the time preference safety he talks about. And I'm not a safety fan. Like Me and him don't get on, but I completely agree with him on time preference. I felt it and seen it myself. So I, I think that's the thing. The incentives of Bitcoin does shift the attitudes of people. But, but, right, over to you, but Jeff. How, but how does that change government spending? So, so I'll, I'll tell you exactly using your numbers. Okay. Uh, that ninety percent of transactions happen on Bitcoin, um, and and that means ten percent happen in government spending. What would have to be the tax rate of that ten percent? What would that do to government? It would break government. No, no, no. I'm saying they're taxing Bitcoin. They're, you're you're paying taxes in Bitcoin. No, but but again, how? No, I'm saying if, if Bitcoin was the the currency. No, you said United no, no, no. You said you said. I hope for a parallel system that 90% of transactions happen outside of the existing system. Okay, now you're talking about, okay, so. Yeah, I, I hope that happens. Right. What would happen to the remaining, what, how fast would the government be insolvent on the 10%? And that's where, that's where. No, this because they're, 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 they're going to, they're going to charge you, you tax, because you're going to have the same monetary system. You're going to have the same GDP, Jeff. It, it's just going to be half. Bitcoin and half uh, uh, dollars, and therefore the government is going to tax you. And if you have to take some of your Bitcoin and turn it into dollars to pay that tax, and that's exactly what you're going to have to do. Yeah. So I w then then what you're saying you're is not going to be able to say, "Hey, 
<laughs> the government, you don't know about these transactions. Therefore, I'm not going to claim this as far as income that people aren't. So, do. so I'm, I'm, I'm telling you that will happen, but Chester, it doesn't matter. Chester, if that, it, uh, that I think is such a low probability. The average Joe and Jane, if they're looking at 20 years in prison, if they cheat on their taxes and you're saying that they're not going to claim their Bitcoin income, I think that probability. Now, maybe there are some people out there that are, you know, uh, tr try to live their life incognito and whatnot. But I think that is an incredibly low percentage. George, George, you said, you said, and this is why I'm trying to get the kind of the kind of the second and third order derivatives of what you said. You said, I hope that there's a parallel system that's outside of the government system. Right. Okay. So, and, and then that grows and grows and grows. And what I'm saying is it can't, yeah, that parallel system imposes cost onto the existing system that changes the existing system. And as people move to that parallel system, which is more efficient, which is lower cost, which is low transaction fees, which is more deflationary, it imposes a cost. As that cost is imposed, governments have two choices. Get on side with it and reduce government. But, but what, let's compare or to a CBDC, or, or, or Jeff. Or what, what, what's the cost? Bitcoin compared to a CBDC, what's the cost there? Because transaction I mean, CBDC we, is going to be lower. No, it is it not. Absolutely. Is. No, no, it, no, it's going no, to be free. It's, it, you're, you're talking about the, the infinite size of a central bank's balance sheet. If they don't want to charge you for a transaction, they're not going to charge you. Okay, so right, so right now they're all talking about doing it on a blockchain, right? A blockchain is just an expensive database. Do it, doing it on a blockchain. So, so just let's let, let, let's say the digital euro and everything else. They're talking about creating a new blockchain that is just an expensive database, right? So they already effectively you already have a database. You already have a ledger of money, uh, a broken ledger of money that's sitting in different uh, databases, and you have Bitcoin, which is imposing a cost tied to energy. That is a that is a new new ledger. Okay. On top of Bitcoin, on top of Bitcoin, you have Lightning, and you have something new coming that's called Fediment and uh, Fediments. That is the transaction cost is is negligible. But it's not free. Almost free. Uh, but not free. CBDC. So you're talking about free. Yeah. So so what you're what you're getting at is, is so it, abundance and money creates scarcity everywhere else. Scarcity in money creates abundance. I'm talking, so what you're talking about is an existing system that can print money out of nothing, abundance in money, creating scarcity everywhere else that most people are going to look through. And their life is going to be getting harder and harder and harder, even though they think they're making that short term trade off. I want more money, but things are getting harder, just like they're making today. And in Bitcoin, it's imposing that scarcity which creating abundance. Yeah, I, I think that that's a stretch too, to sit there and say that scarcity equals abundance. I, I don't think you can say that. that that's, there's a lot of variables in there, Jeff. I mean, but again, because prices fall to the marginal cost of production, scarcity and money will create abundance over time. Um, abundance and money will create scarcity, which we see which you can see it, it, it is creating more monetary units, even if they're free, uh, you're not measuring the externalities of the free, but you're not measuring the, 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 let's look at just productivity for heaven's sakes. Look at how many variables are there. Look at how many government variables go into productivity. And in fact, I, and, it, and you know, just as well as I do, productivity has been going down the last three years. So it, it, it's been going down because you're measuring it through GDP and you're changing the denominator. GDP, where is the, where where is your calculator app in GDP? Where are your photos in GDP? It, these things, as they become more productive, they become free and they're out of GDP. Okay, look, in look, other look, words, you need to if create you get more money. involved, it's going to reduce productivity. Of course. But why is government? Why why does government grow? Because people can't pay their bills, and they'll vote for more government so they can pay their bills. That's why government grows in the first place. You, you have correlation and causation backwards. Now you're sitting there saying that if we go into this, that we gradually go into this uh, parallel ecosystem, which I'm all in favor for, that this is going to create so much wealth that people, once we get that next pandemic, people aren't going to vote for stimulus checks because they're all going to be so wildly wealthy. Uh, that they're not going to want to increase the size of government. And I, no, I, they will. Find, I have a very hard time believing that. And I think that even if you create that parallel system where you've got, let's say, 2% deflation per year, uh, if we look at the 1800s, that's exactly what we had. 
and people still chose to borrow money at a lower price. They still chose the higher interest rate, and they still chose to, when the stuff hit the fan, that let's just go ahead and and take that temporary fix. So I agree with you. So when 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 that temporary fix came in and all the monetary easing came into to the U.S., Bitcoin was about four thousand dollars, and then it went up to seventy thousand dollars or sixty something thousand dollars as a result of that. And it just and 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 again, it didn't care. It was measuring this in advance, right? Of of what's happening on the liquidity. It just keeps on mo- moving. So, so th- will people vote for more stimulus? Yes. And it will debase their currency further. Yes. Will they get poorer out of uh, out of that? Yes. Will government get bigger out of that? Yes. But not in Bitcoin. I hope you're right. I hope you're right. Again, I don't think that we we disagree on the dynamics too much. I just think that we disagree on the probabilities of what uh, Bitcoin will do to uh, human decision making around money. George, is there a chance that uh, you mentioned earlier you wish more people would just vote for smaller government? Can, can you not run the thought experiment whereby a successful uh, Bitcoin doesn't entirely change the role and structure of government, but it puts restraints on them that f- that does reduce their size. I, what type of restraint? Give me an example, Peter. Like they don't have access to an infinite money printer. Uh, like enough people have learned about so tell, the tell, ills how, of... Let's, let's walk through that. How? Let's go hmm. back prior to 2007. How did the government print money? Uh, or let, let me be very specific here. How did the government impact M2 money supply? You will know better than me. They didn't. It's a trick question. It, it's a trick question. They didn't. So if we look at, uh, let's say, M2 from 1980 to 2007, we'll just use that time frame as an example. A lot of people would point to the Fed's balance sheet. They said, well, the Fed, you know, they increased the size of their balance sheet. Then we have a money multiplier. So as the bank reserves increase, this increases balance sheet capacity for the banks, which allows them to lend. So yes, George, we get it that it's really about the commercial banks, but at the end of the day, it's all about the Fed and the Fed's balance sheet. So the Fed's balance sheet in 1980, as far as bank reserves, about 40 billion, 40 billion with a B. In 2007, same, 40 billion. But M2 money supply went from 1.5 trillion up to 7.5 trillion. See, the, 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 the central bank really didn't have anything to do with that. So what we're talking about there, Peter, is the, the vast, vast, vast majority of money supply that we have in the world, especially dollars outside the United States, is specifically created through bank lending, which has nothing to do with the Fed's balance sheet because it's in a system that's pretty much cashless and reserveless. So until so that in, goes until those banks reserve in, in, lending. In, in, so if we have yeah. fractional reserve lending, Peter, even in a Bitcoin standard, it, it, it takes you right back to where we are today because government has very, very little control. Now, it is true that they have control over the aggregate balance sheet, which is a very interesting thought experiment. So in other words, let's just say that they start sp- deficit spending. So that creates more treasuries, but then they're just taking existing M2 and spending it right back. So the net impact on M2 is nothing. It's, it's the exact same, but yet now you have more treasuries. So what they've done is they've increased the actual balance sheet, the aggregate balance sheet, the purchasing power, assuming that these banks can create as much currency as they want based on perceived counterparty risk, which is exactly what happens. So that's an, that's an interesting question. It's can the government increase or decrease the aggregate balance sheet? Answer is yes. And how does that impact inflation or purchasing power? But as far as the government's ability to create more currency units, outside of a couple times in history, you, you just don't see it. It's all the commercial banking system, which goes back to why Bitcoin being full reserve or fraction reserve is such an important question. So, it, which I totally agree with that. And then the question is: So today, it, it, uh, what was the company you you was uh, Peter that you were talking about that sponsored your podcast? Binance BlockFi. or no, no, Block 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 BlockFi. Which which means that that there is a, a free market uh, element in this that BlockFi is trying to be the new bank. FTX is trying to be the new bank. And there's going to be many others, including many of the retail banks today, 
that are going to try to be the new banks on top of the existing Bitcoin rails. And what I think the potentially the only point of disagreement in, in, in this is um, George believes that those will all win and then it'll be fractional reserved. And I, I believe I believe that if as long as Bitcoin stays decentralized and secure, they'll blow up. Over, over, uh, over. I think over, a lot of them will, but that's what people. And, yeah, I think that's a good way to to summarize kind of our differences, Jeff. Yeah, and then and then if and because the only reason that they couldn't blow uh, now, if you go back to M two, the government's role in this is the only reason that they don't blow up which is similar to our existing financial system, is if the government makes them whole, we have the existing financial system, and it gets worse and worse, right? And, and Bitcoin imposes this, that they will blow up. But, but just to be fair, in that world, that the government could bail them out with money that's generated from taxation that people are willing to give to the government, even in they're giving their Bitcoin. That's what I, that's what I mean. Or yeah, okay. or a government is running an inflationary monetary policy, running their own currency against Bitcoin. You could print more monetary units yeah. to be able to bail them out, bail, yeah. bail them yeah. out, and you would. Uh, but but ultimately, the free market essentially Bitcoin imposes a free market discipline that governments can't get away from either. On this, and and citizens will also see this. And but but that is the nugget of what we're talking about, and I and I believe that that if Bitcoin, so I believe in the ethos of Bitcoin. When I'm talking about if it stays decentralized and secure, this is exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. If it stays decentralized and secure, all of this nonsense that will happen, it doesn't matter. The free market's going to win, and it's repricing everything else. Yeah, I think well said, well said, and I think it just distilling it down. It's all about fractional reserve versus full reserve, and how will people vote in that world. Yeah, I think we've reached a nice natural conclusion. Uh, <laughs> any 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 closing uh, thoughts, Jeff? No, I, I thought this was really good. I think these types of conversations, where you where you might have some difference, but you can you can explore that uh, difference kind of in, a, mm. in an open way, <laughs> open way, respectful way. I think they're helpful to a whole bunch of other people that may be watching. So thanks for doing yeah, this, George. Very, well, I, I applaud you, Jeff, and people like Lynn who are out there putting your money where your mouth is and trying to create that parallel system that even if I believe it will have uh, maybe some more flaws based on human nature, it's still going to give us people who value freedom and liberty and privacy and free market capitalism a way to unplug to a certain degree from the, the system, which I think uh, is, is coming our way. And George, um, I, I am just a simple podcast host, and uh, I asked you a question a moment ago where I'm really just repeating things people have told to me, and you've given me a very solid answer. I think it'd be great to do another one-on-one -on -one with you at some point soon, just to go through some of these things and have you explain it, how you see these systems work. Yeah, there's so many bumper stickers out there that are, in my opinion, inaccurate, but people believe them to be yeah. true because they've just been said over and over and over again. Fiat, I'm no fan of fiat currency, but I do believe that people really don't understand the, uh, they, they, they believe that because we have fiat currency that we have way more money supply today than we otherwise would. And I think if they just actually look at the data, it would shock them just like that number that we talked about looking at M2 at the late 1880s compared to today and how today it's gone up at the exact same rate. So either we didn't really constrain money supply back then or uh, fiat currency really hasn't created uh, more currency units than we otherwise would have. Well, I'd love to go through that with you. So I'll ask Danny to uh, give it a few weeks and then uh, try and book something in because uh, you know, you certainly make me rethink some things today. Uh, thank you to both of you. I think people are going to love this. Um, it, it, I think uh, there was a lot of common ground and there was some fair debate on some of the uh, the key points. Um, I'm sure we can do it again in the future, uh, but appreciate you both. And Jeff, I, I'm sure I'm going to see you in person soon. And George, I don't know if I'll ever get to meet you in person, but either way, we have the internet, so we can uh, we can do it this way. Um, thank you both. Um, Jeff, everyone knows 
or who you are, what you do. It's all ego death. <laughs> it's, uh, it's the price of tomorrow. But uh, George, what, what do you want to tell people where to go? Oh, they can just go to my YouTube channel. It's George Gammon, or they can check out the Rebel Capitals channel. I'm not sure when this will air, but uh, we're starting a new website that's re rather crude right now, but we're building it. It's called rebelcapitalist.com, and that's going to be kind of a news aggregator, very similar to Zero Hedge. So we're excited about uh, that project for sure. Well, I'm excited about that. Uh, Jeff, is there anywhere you want to send people? No, all good. You did it. Thanks. All right. All right. Well, on behalf of Jeff, go to railbedford.com. All right. <laughs> thank you both. See you soon. Right. Bye, guys. Thanks. Thanks.